afternoon, and thank you for joining us. My name is Keisha Miller. I'm the Teen Librarian and Volunteer Coordinator here at South Orange Public Library. And so delighted to have with us today the Lady Mechanics of Verona, who are joining us as a part of our annual Makers Month, which actually begins in March, but um, it's 2021. We can do whatever we want. We can just uh, extend that month right on into April. And how appropriate. Uh, we are celebrating National Poetry Month. And that's what the Lady Mechanics of Verona do. So um, before we begin, I just want to uh, get a chance to introduce the members of the Lady Mechanics. And um, I am going to allow you all to do that, starting with Teresa. Hi, everyone. Uh, Teresa Burns here. Helen. Hi, I'm Helen Mazarakis. Marsha. Oh, you're muted. Marsha. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Novice mistake, Marsha LeBeau. Then we have Tina. Tina Kelly, hi. We also have Eleanor. Hi, Eleanor here. Happy Poetry Month. Yay. And the last member is Carol. Hi, I'm Carol Stone. Nope. <laughs> I'm, I'm the last oh. member. I'm the last member, Jessica DeCar. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> sorry, Jessica. It's okay. Seven members with us today. Lovely. Um, who would like to share just a little bit uh, of history of, of the lady mechanics? Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Teresa hi, everybody. Burns. I'm Teresa Burns. Um, I've been a member of the Lady Mechanics now for, I guess, six or seven years. I think uh, a group has been going on longer than that, but I myself joined about six or seven years ago. Um, this is a group that meets really consistently, and I have to say, really productively every other week. Um, in normal times, we meet at the home of Carol Stone, one of our members. She's in Verona, hence the name Lady Mechanics of Verona. Not that Verona, you know, <laughs> Verona, New Jersey. Um, and, you know, so normally we're meeting at Carol's, but of course, during the pandemic, like everyone else, we are uh, meeting on Zoom. Uh, just like uh, all the meetings that are taking place now, just, just as we're doing today. Um, the interesting thing, thing, though, to me that I want to remark on is even though it's all virtual, we've remained really consistent as a group, meeting, continuing to meet about every other, uh, every other week. So I think that's really um, something important. Um, what we do in these meetings is we share our newest work with each other. And that, I have to say, involves a lot of trust of the members of the group, okay? You're bringing in your fledgling poems, you know? No one else has seen these yet. So there are usually, you know, lots of issues, lots of things to talk about. So um, it, it really is something that involves trust. And I, I just wanna take this moment to thank all of the lady mechanics that we've been working with together uh, for allowing me to watch with these brand new kind of fledgling poems. Um, I also want to thank the people at South, South Orange Library, especially Keisha Miller uh, and to Michael Pucci um, for making this event possible. Uh, I was thrilled when Keisha reached out to me a couple of months ago and said, hey, we have this Makers Month thing in March and maybe the Lady Mechanics can talk about making a poem, making a poetry group, you know, all the things that you do when you get together as poets. And I thought that was a fabulous idea. Um, so while we have done readings together as a group, we've actually never done that kind of sort of talk or a panel discussion kind of thing. So this is a little new for us, but we're very, very excited to try it. Um, so I'll just walk through kind of what we're going to do with the hour that we have together. Uh, in the first half of the program, we're going to start out with a short reading 
we thought instead of going through everybody's, you know, bios and where they've published their poems and stuff like that, you can always get that online or on their websites. We thought we'd start out by just having a short reading. Uh, for this first half, we'll have four of the lady mechanics read one poem for you. Um, and then we'll go into a discussion first of the making of a poet. And that's gonna be led by Carol Stone. Then we're gonna talk about making a poetry community. And that's gonna be led by Marsha LeBeau. Then we're gonna talk about the creation of a publishing record. And that involves getting your poems out into the world, either in mm -hmm. journals, which is usually the first step, literary journals, and then eventually in books. And that's going to be led by Jessica de Koning and Tina Kelly. So, but before we go into those little content areas, we're gonna do uh, a reading and we will start with Carol Stone. It's going to be uh, Carol Stone, Marsha LeBeau, Jessica de Koning, and Tina Kelly in that order. So do you wanna read your poem first, Carol? Absolutely. Okay, I'm gonna read a poem from my book, which is called Late. That's my favorite hat on the cover. That's why I wanted to show it to you. <laughs> Knowledge. Who is left to remember Mrs. Wilcox stamping the dates in blue on the card in its tiny envelope glued in the two books you could take out for a week? Who is left to remember lingering in the dark stacks until closing time, touching the books as if they were parents who could fill you with knowledge. Langston Hughes and his dream, Millay, with whom I rode all night on the ferry. Whitman, whose free verse I embraced. I am left to remember, me of the after school library hours, who went home to a house without love, the girl who raised herself page by page. Mm. Okay, thank you, Carol. Marshall LeBeau is next. I'm gonna read <clears throat> a new poem, fairly new poem called <laughs> A Mind at Home with Itself. My brain is always complaining as it crawls toward El Dorado, <clears throat> eyes upturned waiting for a lightning storm to stun it speechless. But the sky never claps open and there's no silence. It's knees bleeding, mouth running. My brain doesn't hear the alarm go off in the morning. Forgets to cancel its gym membership even though it stopped going years ago. I have no choice but to ignore my brain. Walk to the other side of the street when I see it. Stop answering its whiny voicemails. I have a vision during a massage of my brain glistening like raw hamburger meat on the pavement below a flashing motel sign. The meat turns to blue glitter slime the neighborhood kids sell for 50 cents a bag that smells like cotton candy. I steal a bag because it's my brain after all and toss it on the kitchen counter. My brain is petrified I'm going to throw it away and begs for mercy. I pick it up, slap it on the table, pound it, then ooze it between my fingers. It feels smooth and cold and reassuring. I need it a little longer before I throw it in the trash. My hands are stained blue, glitter flecks my clothes, but finally, silence. Thank you, Marsha. Um, Jessica is gonna go next. I'm gonna read an older poem. The man in his undershirt wants me. <laughs> Bruce Springsteen hangs on the cork board next to my desk, right where I tacked him. If my office had a window, I could look outside. Instead, we stare at each other blindly. The posters, his ad for Sirius Radio, Sirius a star as far from here as I would like to be. Bruce's YT says, don't be so serious, come out and play with me. 
I think, get serious, boss. In that shirt, it's wrinkled. Why not a crisp one? You can afford it. Someone could iron or buy a replacement, a black button down like you wear on stage. Here I sit, shut inside, listening to the drone of the air cooling condenser. I should take his advice, quit my job, go to a concert, or drive to the beach, rip off my clothes and jump in. Together, we could break this trap, but his legs have been airbrushed away. Below the undershirt hem, I see only a wall with a geometric pattern splattered on concrete. You're right, boss. There's no place left to hide. And you're wrong. We are not going to walk in the sun. There's nothing there, Bruce, just paint, a picture of paint, like the residue of an accident, the phantom limb of an amputee. Oh. Ooh. Thank you, Jessica. And last but certainly not least is Tina Kelly. Hi, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, because sometimes I think it's easier to read along. Um, this is called Vitamin Awe. It's from my latest book called Rise Wildly. Awe, measured in two different ways, was the strongest predictor of lower levels of proteins associated with stress. And that's an epigraph that comes from Emotion, a journal of the American Psychological Association. For life-lasting doses, trip to Yosemite, hike up Horseshoe Canyon at dusk for gilt clouds, best pictures, storm at the rocky beach, otter speeding, once ever moments, the bald eagle over Route 10, a shiny black car tagged deceit passing on the right, Nashville warbler on the roof in Seattle, saw wet owl perched on the fence by the Newark Bureau, how to measure it. In postcards, inches, palpitations per minute, cc's of happy tears. In self-reports from college freshmen, how to find awe at the golden hour, a half a cup from the travel brochure, the sun dancing to fire's rhythm, watching with binoculars the purple finch sing. Play me music soaring so high I dread death. Show me the old songwriter playing her guitar's dreams. I'll fix some lemon tea, spend time with the fresh thoughts of the astronomer, his theory of a cyclic bouncing universe, of another big bang next Thursday, another beetle species discovered before dying out, an hour to smell jasmine and knit, the yarn, something shiny for my fingers. Thank you, Tina, and thank you to uh, all four readers for sharing those poems with us. Um, so now we're going to go to Carol Stone, and she's going to talk just for a few minutes about the making of a poet, what it takes. Carol? So much to say. <laughs> well, I made a few notes to myself starting with that poetry is about language. As Ezra Pound said, the best words in the best order. Being a poet is generally speaking, being in love with words. But first and foremost, this may come as a shock to some, it's about revision. And that's of course what our group is all about. Some people think that being a poet is an isolating experience. For me, it's just the opposite. When I'm writing, I'm just good with the world. I think sometimes I might be more lonely with people, but anyhow, poetry is persistence. And naturally, you're going to be discouraged. To be a poet, you have to expect to write many drafts. You have to expect to be rejected by journals. You will want to read your poems at readings, both for personal gratification and as a career move if you want your books to sell. 
Poetry means different things to different people. For example, we have political po po poets. And I think political poetry is the most important thing in the world we live in right now. And I think of all the poets who have written political poems. Uh, for example, Denise Levertov during the Vietnam War, Adrienne Rich's feminist poems, uh, and most recently, of course, Amanda Gorman. So poetry can be extremely useful and satisfying in that way. Uh, I think as a poet, it's important to read poetry. I'm constantly be amazed by some poets who don't read poetry. I just don't understand it. But in any case, I always have my Pablo Neruda sitting on my desk, desk and my Frank O'Hara right next to him. And the inspiration comes up right through the books. Um, as exemplified by today, poetry is community and there's going to be more about that later. Poetry is going into yourself, getting your feelings out and down in words. And that is not always so easy. I think one of my favorite poets who is both political and who says some things that are so shocking, I'm afraid to read them is Allen Ginsberg. So in short, there are all kinds of ways of experiencing poetry, both as a writer and as a reader and I couldn't be living my life without it. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, and now we're gonna hear about, uh, more about the making of a poetry community and Marshall LeBeau is gonna lead us through that. Thank you, Teresa. Um, so as Amanda Gorman, says, everybody knows who she is. Poetry has never been the language of barriers. It's always been the language of bridges. At some point when you're writing, you wanna connect with others who build those bridges. Having different poets with different lenses looking at your poems to see if they are conveying what you want them to convey will help you hone your craft. In other words, if you wanna get better, you have to share your work. And this becomes your poetry community. How do you find that community? There's several ways to find your poetry people. Um, you can find it very organically. Many poetry groups started by a few, as little as two people meeting in a class or a reading or a program and decided to share work with each other. And from that small group grows a larger one. That's kind of how the Lady Mechanics started. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now because I have some resources and websites. So let me see, crossing my fingers. Do you see it? No. No? No. Sure. I see. I do. I see. Yeah. You may have to minimize your boxes, you know, the Zoom boxes in order to see it. Are you talking to me or to everybody else? I mean, everybody. Okay. No, I can see yours very clearly now. Okay, great. Um, so first libraries, where we are, or kind of where we are. <laughs> um, the South Orange Library has the Creative Writing Group online on Wednesday afternoons from one to two, um, where I think they do prompts and write and share. Um, Montclair has a group called the Right Group that is very popular, but look at, look at your local library. That's where a great place to start and it's free. Um, local groups, find something that's already in existence. The South Mountain Poets um, has been in existence for like 30 years. Um, we are on hiatus. I'm a part of that group. We're on hiatus right now, but there's the Facebook page listed up there. Um, if you're interested in getting information when they start up again, West Orange Arts Council um, does a group on Saturday mornings, but that's on hiatus too. But I think they're looking to start another one. You know, because of the pandemic, like things are online or offline or not. So um, I'm just putting things on there that um, are local and, and popular. Um, Arts by the People, 
Paul Rabinowitz runs this great organization that has readings and workshops and everything. Um, and they also have something called The Seller on Wednesday nights that I think is online now um, where you can share your work. Um, right before the pandemic, I created The Right Space in Orange, New Jersey for poets and writers of all genres to have a quiet place to go and write and meet other writers because I wanted more community. Obviously um, that did not happen as I imagined. So everything I'm doing right now mostly is virtual. I have an accountability group um, for parent writers submission day, which we're gonna be talking about later um, once a month and writing um, virtually together. So I open a Zoom room on Monday mornings for two hours where people can write together um, because we, you know, we want community even though we can't be together in a space, we want to create a space for being together. Um, and um, the website is listed there. Go to readings. Readings are a phenomenal place to meet poets um, and learn what you like um, and be part of readings. Um, if, if you want to find out where any, any readings are, join Elaine um, Koplau, I think is Koplau. I don't know how to pronounce her name but she runs a reading series, but she has a newsletter you can get on her list. Um, then there's the New Jersey Poet Events calendar. And there's, I have to give a plug to Teresa's reading, the Watershed Literary Events, co uh, sponsored by the South Orange Department of Cultural Affairs. That's four times a year they do readings. Um, the next one is Sunday, May 16th. They're all on Sundays. Um, and then classes. You can meet other poets in classes and really hone your craft there. Um, the South Orange Maplewood Adult School has some great classes. I know Teresa teaches there. Um, the Writers Circle, great classes um, for teens and um, adults. Murphy Writing of Stockton University, great getaways and workshops. And also for craft, Diane Lockwood's newsletter, sign up. That's an incredible resource if you don't know about it already. Um, what I've learned about groups is that if you start something, once you start, keep showing up. I mean, that's why the lady mechanics still exist because we keep showing up. That's why South Mountain Poets um, lasted, lasts for 30 years. Um, consistency is key. People know you're serious about your work and others work. Um, if you join something and it isn't working for you, leave or take a break and find something else. There are plenty of groups around. And then lastly, becoming a poet citizen. Go beyond your own poetry. Go to readings of your friends, to all the people who are here for us and listening to this panel. Thank you. You're being a poet citizen. <laughs> um, start, a, start something crazy like a space where people go to write. <laughs> Um, start a reading series, uh, do things for free. I think that goes without saying there's not money in poetry. <laughs> um, you know, unless you teach, um, you're going to have to be doing a lot of things for free. And that's part of it because we love it. Um, share your friends, books and poems online on Facebook or wherever you share, um, help your non-writing community embrace poetry. I can't tell you the number of times I hear, I thought I hated poetry and then I read this poem or I heard, you know, somebody read. So, you know, just keep, keep spreading the good word. Thank you. And I'm also, I'm going to put this resource in the chat so you can have that. Now I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Marsha, that was terrific. Um, so we're gonna move on to creating um, a publishing record. I mean, it's- could you, could, you get, could you get me back again? Oh, you, you wanna make a comment, Carol? You can just make a comment. I'm so, I've got the Zoom screen in front of me. No, that's that's fine. We move to now. You should see everybody. You should see all the boxes because Marcia stopped sharing her screen. Oh well, right. I you're, don't. You're good. Oh, you do see everybody, or you don't? Does everybody see the boxes now? 
Yes? Okay. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on to creating a publishing record of our work and kind of take that next step. It's often a scary step uh, to bring your poems from you know, either your one or two friends or your poetry group. You feel confident enough to maybe send it out, writing and publish. So first, Jessica de Koning is gonna talk about getting published in journals. That's usually the first step. Jessica. Thank you. And really there's nothing scary about sending out your work because you're not in conversation with the other person. You're doing it online or, so don't think of it as scary. Just think of it as daily chore. Um, because for both beginning and established poets, publication does, as Teresa said, begin with journals. Um, journals may be in print or online or some combination of both. There are many more print uh, online journals than when I started sending work out, that is for sure. Uh, and I and I don't know if there'll be fewer and fewer print journals. That's a conversation for another day. Most journals are for, to some degree competitive and the more established and better known journals are the most competitive. But many journals welcome new poets and there are a variety of sources to find ideas where to submit your work. Uh, the Journal Poets and Writers, that's pw.org, publishes lots of lists on their website, if you're not a subscriber to the print journal, of journals looking for poems um, and themes of different journals. The blog, Creative Writing Opportunities, or C-R-W-O-P-P-S, for short, is a running list of um, journals that are looking for, and occasionally anthologies, looking for publications. Duotrope, which is a subscription service, uh, has a running list of deadlines, which is an important piece of information, um, as well as journals that are looking for uh, specific topics. Um, and as I indicated, often journals are looking for work on a, on a particular theme. So look at those sources and also look at submittable, which gets us into how do I send in my work? Back in prehistoric era, when I started submitting poems, it was pretty complicated because you had to send a lot of pieces of paper and return envelope and then hope that sooner or later you get something rejected back in the mail. Um, it doesn't work that way anymore. Many journals accept work by email and many more use a subscription a submission manager. Um, most use a manager called Submittable. It's the most common. And Submittable also publishes lists of who's looking for work right now and what their deadlines are. Sometimes there is a small fee involved. If it's a large fee, you may not want to bother. If it's a small fee, you may not want to bother. But when I think about it, it's not two or three dollars is not more expensive than the cost of copying many sheets of paper, buying postage and all of that. Um, most journals permit simultaneous submissions. Some don't, but most do. It's just if your work gets accepted somewhere, you have to be courteous and withdraw it in other places. It is really important to follow submission guidelines meticulously. I read for a very, very, very small journal. I do not look at stuff that doesn't, it's, there's, it's just too time consuming to read things. If the theme is um, my pet dog and somebody sends something about their mother, it's not gonna get read. So follow submission guidelines meticulously, like where your name is supposed to be on the page so people can find it. I know it sounds silly, but all of that stuff is important. Cover letters may or may not be um, required. Sometimes they're useful, sometimes they're not. Follow the guidelines. If it's a poem, for example, that the editor has asked you to send, put that in your submit a letter. Like I, we met, you asked for this poem, here it is, I hope you use it. Expect a lot of rejections. Expect 10 times at least 
as many rejections as acceptances, maybe more like 60 times as many rejections as acceptances. And then once you get your rejection, you have to do two seemingly contradictory things. You have to be open to revision. You have to really think about whether this poem is working as well as it needs to be, or are there things that you should be doing to, to make the poem sing even more? At the same time, um, trust your own work. I had a poem that I sent out, I don't know how many times that I knew was one of my best work. And sooner or later it got picked up by a more prestigious journal than most of my other poems have. So do both those things. Read, 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 attend readings, get to know other poets, get to know editors. If you want somebody to ask for a copy of your poem, you've got, they've got to hear you read it. And that's happened to most of us, I'm sure at least once in our writing career that somebody's asked for a poem uh, from one of us. Additionally, that's how you get to know publishers. There are a lot of local publications. If you know the person say, dear editor whose name I know, I love meeting you at fill in the blank. And I hope you look at some of these poems. I would really encourage if you're new, send to local publications. They are interested in promoting local writers and um, want to and want to get to know you and your work. And I wish you all the best of luck. And I hope to see poems from all of you whose work I'm not familiar with or haven't seen before very soon. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jessica. And uh, Tina Kelly now is going to talk about books. Tina, who has had, how many books, Tina? How many Four. have you published? Four. Four. She's working on her fifth. <laughs> so she knows a lot about book publishing. Thank you. Um, I don't feel like I do. I feel like I've done something five times and I can still learn so much on how to do this because putting manuscripts together is really challenging. Um, there's a book coming out at some point about how to do it um, by Two Sylvia's Press that um, I contributed to. And I hope that um, when, when we can get the word out on that, once that comes out, um, I think um, I wanna add to what Jessica said when she said, read, read, read. I think it's very important and I do not do this very well is to read a ton of publications and see which one really speaks to you. See which one sounds like what you write. And if you find that publication, then just send to them a lot and first and keep sending to them. If they say, we like this, you came close, send us more, then do send them more. Um, I need to read more publications because I feel sometimes when I'm sending my stuff out, I'm sort of sending it blind and not know the, the vibe of the poems that they are accepting. Um, when it comes to putting a book together, I think there's really nothing more valuable than a group like the Lady Mechanics. And we're named that because we are um, kind of a femme forward, gentle group that tinkers, looks under the hood of a poem and tinkers and makes it better. And we all believe in each other's mission. And that kind of positive support is priceless. Um, a lot of poetry workshops do not read full manuscripts for each other, but we have a schedule where um, once every six weeks or so, or eight weeks, I don't know, we will encourage each other to put together a chapbook or a um, manuscript, and then we'll go through it and read it and, and make recommendations on the order that things are in and which are the strongest, which are the weakest, which should go first, which should go last. So if you can find a group that can do that, um, you're, you're very, very lucky. And if you have a poetry reading group that you want to take to the next level, I encourage you to challenge each other to come up with a manuscript because it's hard. And I think we all get better by helping each other do it. So when I'm thinking about putting a manuscript together, I keep all my published poems in one place. When they get accepted, you know, one out of every 40 that I send out. When one gets accepted, I put it in the published poems file on my computer. And that's sort of the groundwork for the next book. 
uh, when I think I have a critical mass of them, or if I have some new ones that I really feel good about, that I think if I put all my good ones, my keepers together, I'll have 40, or if, if it's a chapbook, maybe 25, if it's a full collection, maybe 50. And I, um, I read it through. I get my greatest hits and see if there's enough there to make a collection. And it's overwhelming. It depends on what mood you're in. I find if I'm on my exercise bike, I love my poems when I read them, um, when I'm reading that collection. If I'm reading them when I'm tired and grouchy and not feeling confident, then I don't think there's a book there. So your mood may vary and depend on your, your verdict may depend on, on your mood that given day, but it's a many days process. And because it's overwhelming, what I tend to do is take it in individual tiny steps. And the first thing I do when I'm sitting down reading a collection or a possible collection is I grade them on a scale of one to 10. And if I love something, I know that it will read well at a reading. If it's something that I want to be remembered for, it gets a nine. If I think I've workshopped it and, and people agree that it's a, a real good poem, that's a nine. There's a whole lot of sixes and sevens that you have to look at and consider. And um, if I have enough sevens, eights, and nines, then I think maybe I'm getting close to having a collection. And then it's time to put them in order which is another challenge. Sometimes that's by, um, alpha, not alphabetical order, by chronological order. Um, sometimes it's in clumps. Like I often will have love poems, baby poems, journalism poems, nature poems, um, ecstatic poems. And so those clumps go in certain orders. Um, at that point, I'm usually ready to share it with the lady mechanics. Um, they'll have their opinions as to what should go first, what welcomes people in, what pushes people away. Um, should there be subheadings? Should the subheadings have names? And then we sit on it for a while, at least I do, and reread it after a while, add in new poems. One useful exercise is to find your five strongest and your five weakest. I just took out my weakest from my collection that the ladies have seen recently and I'm feeling about a six and a half on the whole thing so I have to wait a while till I get some more acceptances and some more new poems but um, once you have a manuscript the hardest question to answer is are you proud of it and I have a dear friend who won't send anything out until she can answer yes to that are you proud of this collection do you really want it in the world or are you just hoping that it'll get out there. Um, so that can take another month or year or seven new poems or a nice long bike ride while you're reading them to think, yes, I am proud of them. I'm ready to send them out as a collection. And it gets expensive. There are a lot of places that charge money to reject you, which is their business model and they're justified in doing that. But it, you've got to realize that, especially with contests, I just, didn't win a contest that had 2,100 applicants and three winners. Um, it can be pretty dreary out there, but you also, it doesn't, in some ways, there's not a deadline. You can still keep writing poems, still keep adding to the collection. It keeps getting better as time passes. You send it to different contests. You send it to the same contests who have different judges. You send it to local places first and then harder places second perhaps, or, or maybe you think it's a, a absolute winner who has to go to Norton Poetry Anthology first, then you send it there. But local presses are um, sometimes easier to get in or at least more sympathetic. And I found my first publisher because they would, they weren't charging a contest fee or they were agreeing to publish three or four from a contest. So all of a sudden I felt, well, my $20 has three times the chances of success. So I went with um, WordPress, um, Word Tech Communications in Cincinnati for my first two. And my second two went to Kevin Carey Press, which is a New Jersey based, uh, very warm family of poets to be in. And I recommend them. And that's about it. Thanks so much, Tina. Um, so we're going to now begin the, the second half of the program. Um, we'll, like we did before, we'll begin with a short reading 
uh, by the remaining lady mechanics, there's three of us, and then we'll look closely at a particular poem and try to take apart together what makes it tick. You know, what's working about this poem? You know, um, why is it a poem? And, and what are some of the ways that it's achieving what it's trying to achieve? Uh, but first, I'm gonna introduce the three readers. First up is Eleanor Mattern is gonna read us a poem. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> oh, it's so great to be here. Thank you, Teresa and Keisha and everybody. Wonderful. Why couldn't I have been an opera singer? The poem still being worked on is going to be the best poem I've ever written. If I can just pack into it everything I've ever learned about poems and revising and editing. But of course, the problem with trying to remember all that stuff and trying to do it all at the same time like the need to juggle the form with the music and weave the artichokes and the cement blocks into the narrative. Check the scansion, mark the syllables and the hum and thrum of euphony, cut abstractions like love or pain and don't tell, but show with detail how Amsterdam was that night in the snow and create original metaphors like having the sun do something the sun would never do, like climb a stairway and be honest in the confession, eliminating self-pity and adjectives, yet be emotionally authentic when telling the story of your friend's abortion, for example, and employing a social consciousness without being heavy-handed or pedantic or turning it into a rant. Vanish cliches, the passive voice, ING endings, but don't forget that you can break a rule now and then, is like trying to drive a car with one foot on the brake, like a caterpillar who trips over her own feet when she concentrates on where to put them. All right, thank you, Eleanor. Um, next is Helen Mazarakis is going to read us a poem. Thanks, Teresa. Um, okay, this is called, We Each Do It Well. My mother taught each of her six daughters, but none makes them quite the same. We use the same recipe, though none writes it down. The shortening, the baking powder. We learn to mix quickly, handle the batter as little as possible so it isn't too tough. Each of us has stood by her side at the counter, turned the dough out onto a floured board, and copied her deft movements, her wiping of a cheek with the back of her hand, leaving a trace of flour. One by one, we tried on our own, under her tutelage, now in our own kitchens, on our own flowered boards, sometimes with children beside us copying our deft movements. We each do it well, though none quite compare to her, light, fluffy, butter melting, and a spoonful of strawberry jam taken from a silver fluted dish. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Thanks so much. Um, let's see. I am now going to share a poem with you that is a sonnet. Uh, it's called The Last Week of a Long Winter. The last week of a long winter, I remember the way the trees keep one another alive in times of distress, shear sugars and fluids from the taproot up through pith and sapwood, heartwood, the inner bark, branch out through capillary action to the terminal buds that dot their crowns, take in the same ions that I breathe and the ones on any fringe breathe, and not just food, but news, secrets, warnings, gossip, pulses, static, comprehending that to love one is to love the hum of chatter beneath, the valley lit by fireflies, the hive, the well, the cup, the drinking in, the yard last April to hang on by pulp, by sinew, 
to keep turning green. Thank you. Um, so the next thing we are going to do here, and I hope this works, I am now going to uh, share my screen. We are going to look at a particular poem all together. And three of us are just gonna be talking about it almost the way we talk about a poem in our group sessions. Um, just what makes it tick and, and what's working about it. So the poem we chose was called Losing by Ada Limon. I'm gonna share it and then I believe it's Eleanor who's going to read it for us out loud, okay? All right, so let me... All right, now I have a note that says the host is disabled participant screen sharing. Um, Keisha, is it possible to make me, try again to make me a host? I'm gonna try that again, hold on one second. All right, Teresa, I think I can do it. You should be able to now, Teresa, I think. I make you oh. co-host, Teresa. Okay, can right. we can we go back to participants then? Okay, so let me try. There we go, thank you. Let's see. Okay, how does that look? Can everybody see the Ada Limon poem? Yes. Looks great. <clears throat> Very okay. good. Okay, I tried to get it on one screen so that we don't have to be scrolling and stuff. Okay, so this is the poem that we're going to work with. Um, and Eleanor Mattern is going to read it for us out loud. Okay. Losing. After your father gets lost for the third time, you get angry because he won't answer his phone. Part of me wants him to stay lost. God, what has, what has stolen my generosity? He pours a bowl of cereal and milk and leaves the refrigerator door open. He calls you boss and me mother. Yes, mother, he says, and rolls his eyes when I tell him to eat something, to clean up after himself. Would I be more patient with a child? Would I love the smallness of life more than the goneness of the mind? Yes, I don't know what to do with him. So I cook elaborately, pea salad with blanched red onions, radishes and asparagus, scalloped potatoes, all good things that come from the ground. He eats the mini eggs I've left for guests until they're gone. He says, how do you feel about abortion? I explain how you can eat violets and dandelions and wild chives so that we almost have an edible lawn. He says he, he hates birds. I laugh and ask him, how can you hate birds? He says he hates them because they're everywhere. <clears throat> they're all over, everywhere you look. And we look up at the sky together. Turns out he's right. Those damn things are everywhere. Now, we're gonna look at this poem together and think about how did the poet make this poem, this artifact of words. And you're probably, <clears throat> you're probably maybe familiar from school with the old uh, English teacher's uh, tool of the studying the elements of literature or the elements of poetry. And I uh, came across a slightly different list that the poet Gregory Orr developed. He calls them the four temperaments of poetry. And I think it's a very effective lens with which to look at poems. So we can use this list of four, of four temperaments when we make a poem, when we read and enjoy a poem on our own. We also can use it in revising our own work and in giving constructive feedback to other poets as we do in the Lady Mechanics. So um, I'll name the four elements, I'll touch on them, and then Helen, Teresa, and I, as Teresa said, will use kind of roughly these elements or temperaments to talk about the poem losing. So the way Orr divides it up 
he says we have story, form, music, and imagination or image. Now, of course, story is the narrative thread of a poem, but we know not every poem is a narrative poem. So you can kind of break poems into two types, two big type categories of either narrative or lyric. The narrative, of course, the story comes through. With a lyric poem, it can be more of a focus on a memory, a, uh, a moment, an emotion. So we have story, we have form, which of course I'm sure you realize is the way the poem is structured and uh, the lineation, the way the stanzas are on the page. Then we have music, which covers a whole lot of things, rhyme, to, to rhyme or not to rhyme, rhythm, and uh, all the things that the ear will pick up in a poem. And then we have the realm of the imagination, which includes the images, the use of metaphor, figurative language. Not every poem is gonna have all four of these. But you may notice that most strong poems have several, if not three or four. As a poet writing, and also as a poet working with other poets, the image part is what always stands out for me. <clears throat> we probably have our, our favorites of the temperaments. So I just want to touch on, for starters, that in this lovely poem by Ada Limon, some of the images are so striking. And the concrete image, what a concrete image does is ground the poem and bring the reader in through the experience of the senses, things we can see or taste or smell. Um, so a great example of that for starters is the cereal in the bowl. This works on several levels in my experience because we have the concrete thing, we can see the bowl, we can see the spoon, we can see the cereal, and then it has symbolic weight because of the experience of family, childhood, meals together. So it may also carry emotional weight. Um, so I think that this, like for starters, the cereal in the bowl is a terrific image to focus on. If we were in our group, we would be, if it felt like an unfinished poem, we'd be saying, oh, look at how the, the image of that jumps out at us. The refrigerator also jumps out. The food items jump out, the birds themselves, and the sky. And I will uh, let Teresa and Helen jump in. And as I said, we'll be kind of taking turns. Hey, thanks, uh, Eleanor. Um, Eleanor started off, you know, these four temperaments. The first one was story. And uh, this poem, Losing, uh, is a narrative poem. Uh, Eleanor talked about the difference between a lyric and a narrative poem. There's many ways to categorize poems, but that's just one of them. Uh, and as she said, a lyric poem is gonna be uh, less literal, often a little more abstract, a little more focused on music. This one tells a story. So it's literally, you know, this happened, then this happened, then this happened. That's what a narrative poem is, but it's, it's not all it is. It, it also has to transcend just being a simple story, right? It's gotta, at some point, do something bigger than that. It's gotta become universal. It's gotta connect with other people who do not know you and don't care about your story, your individual story. So if we just look at this poem, uh, again, just for its narrative spine, what's, what is happening? I once had a, um, I think it was actually Billy Collins, who I had in a workshop in graduate school who used to say as the first step in discussing a poem, you know, can anybody just paraphrase what's going on in this poem? And if I were to do that here, um, I'd say this is, uh, you know, this is a, a poem where the speaker, uh, the speaker, and we can assume that's Ada Limon, but we think it's Ada Limon, the speaker uh, has had her father-in-law around Okay, we don't know if there's, he's staying there permanently or if he's just visiting, but the father-in-law is around and um, she's getting a little annoyed. You know, we get the sense that maybe there's a little bit of dementia in the father-in-law. Why do we know that? 
your father gets lost for the third time and you get angry because he won't answer his phone. And he keeps doing things like leaving the refrigerator door open and other sort of mildly annoying things. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of the poem is about the speaker reporting on these little annoyances. And as Eleanor said, that's where you get some of these images. I mean, he's, this, this is sort of particularly annoying for her when he calls you the husband, he calls you boss and me mother. Yes, mother, he says, and rolls his eyes when I tell him to eat something, to clean up after himself. So when he does that, he's, you can imagine how a woman would not be crazy about having her husband referred to as the boss and her referred to as mother, you know? And then she sort of becomes the mother a little bit, telling him to eat something and clean up after himself. So in spite of herself, she seems to become this stuff. So, you know, how can she relate to this guy? She says, I don't know what to do with him. You know, I don't know how to entertain him. I don't know how to talk to him on his level. So I cook elaborately. She's interested, what, what is the speaker interested in? She's interested in the garden and taking wonderful natural things from the earth. And she's killing herself, right? Making all these fancy dishes that she hopes that he appreciates. And how does he respond? He says, how do you feel about abortion? <laughs> you know, probably not the first thing the speaker wants to talk about, right? So it's almost like he's itching for a fight there. Um, so she tries to, again, engage him in the, the food and the plantings and stuff like that. And finally, he says he hates birds. Well, you can just, you can almost feel the speaker's frustration down here. He says he hates them because they're everywhere. And she says, how can you hate birds? I mean, that just seems impossible. And she goes outside with them and they look up at the sky together. And there she is at the end saying, turns out he's right. Those damn things are everywhere. So I don't know about you guys, but for me, when I read that poem, that was kind of a surprising ending. I wasn't expecting that poem to end there with her kind of, I don't know, being on team father-in-law, you know, a little bit in terms of the birds. So, you know, that's kind of the magic crazy thing about what happens in a poem. It can go to really unexpected places, but it's always with intent. So then you have to discuss why did she land there? Is she trying to say that, you know, my father-in-law's right about everything? Um, probably not. Um, did she just in that moment kind of give in uh, to, to the kinds of stuff he was focused on and forget about the stuff she's focused on? Maybe, but that's the fun of discussing a poem. You know, what was the intent there? So let me just say one more thing before we, we uh, I wanna go on to uh, Helen. Um, one of the things I guess you could ask, well, so if it's just a narrative, if it's a straight narrative, pretty much, how come this is a poem? Like, why isn't it a piece of prose that just tells a story? Isn't that what, you know, nonfiction is? And I guess so, except one of the things that poets do is they learn how to um, back and forth and modulate between abstraction and the kind of literal narrative telling, like Eleanor was saying before, for, you know, a, a bowl of cereal, the, the blanched red onions, we can all see those things. But then right in the middle of the poem, you know, or in that second stanza, she says, God, what has stolen my generosity? You know, she throws a, a question in there. So we know she's kind of, there's some kind of interior dialogue going on in there. Um, and then later she, she, when she has to be so patient with the father-in-law, she says, would I be more patient with a child? Would I love the smallness of a life, smallness of a life more than the goddess of the mind? Yes, she would. So she's honest with herself, but it's those kinds of interior questions that's gonna keep this from just being a straight ahead piece of prose. It's really a poem. 
So Helen, I wonder if you could say a few things about the form of this poem. Sure, I'm, I'm just gonna say a little bit about, um, it, when you look at a poem on the page, the form is how it's, how you break lines, how you um, sometimes, um, how you arrange it on a page even. Um, this is mostly um, a poem with couplets and couplets are um, two lines that um, traditionally complete a thought, um, either you know one sentence or two sentences that that are are one thought. A cup, you know, two. Uh, Dr. Seuss, I will not eat the Sam I am. I will not eat green eggs and ham. That's a couplet. Um, uh, what's What's interesting in this poem is that she uses couplets, but she intersperses them with with single lines um, and. Sometimes um, it, it could easily be a tercet. It could easily be three, uh, three lines that complete the thought, um, but she cuts it. For example, I mean, the same line that uh, Teresa noted earlier, um, uh, where, where she says, uh, he says, yes, mother, and rolls break his eyes when I tell him to eat something to clean up after himself. Yes, mother, he says, and rolls is the end of the couplet but it doesn't end the thought. She's going to continue, but it does end a different thought. Um, mm. so, uh, so it's sort of interesting the way that she's bouncing back and forth um, between the couplets and singlets. Um, the other thing is that as you look at this, as we look at this poem anyway, um, she's in kind of a battle with herself and with her father-in-law. She, she's She's really fighting against what what she has to do with him, what, how um, he bought, how he annoys her, all of that, um, and um, and it's interesting that that when she gets to the end of the poem, she switches to all single lines. So as she's sort of maybe losing the battle, maybe losing him, maybe something like that, she mm -hmm. switches to the single lines. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe she's maybe she's laying her arms down yeah, yeah. <laughs> calling it a draw mm -hmm. uh, Eleanor do you want to say anything I'd love to jump say in more about images maybe yes I'd love to just jump in and add um that one of the things poets do is condense language so you know um a lot of it is um very concise and the other thing is all the details the the details in this poem really jump out um, many of them are concrete, but not all. So I just wanted to mention, Teresa was, was throwing out the questions that we would go through talking about this poem with other poets. You know, why did she choose this? Why did she end here? And I was struck myself by the fact that she mentions that the foods that come from the ground, and of course there's so much everything, she's thinking about the symbolism um, that this person is, you know, the end of his life is coming, he is uh, approaching. So the, the mention of the ground mm. is very significant and symbolic. And then the sky. So we have the ground and then the sky. And then I just think it's such a beautiful parting image of even though we think it's the, the father-in-law and daughter-in-law, although when you first read the poem, you may not know that. You may think it's a father and daughter. Mm -hmm. And the two of them looking up at the sky together is such a lovely image of parent-child. Mm -hmm. And again, so freighted with symbolism and um, emotional content. I hadn't even thought of that, the part about, you know, the, the use of the word ground, because clearly he's getting getting on an age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. That's the one lyric moment in the poem, look up at the sky together. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, what, another thing that's kind of interesting here is, what do you make of that title? Losing. I mean, that could play in so many different rooms. Let's just talk about that for a second. Losing, losing her, losing her, um, losing her mind with this, with this crazy guy. Losing, uh, losing him. Um, yeah, he, he may be. He may be losing. You know, some of his cognitive abilities, and she seems to be kind of on the edge too. You know, she's she's well, losing. And early on, she says. What, where, oh, where's the line? What, what has stolen my generosity? Mm. I love the argument with self of wanting to be a better person, 
than she is evidencing. And then being willing to write a poem that shows not her best self, mm. the, the human struggle. And who was it? Some famous poet once said the best poems are the arguments with the self. I don't remember who, but, mm. um, and that's one of the other strategies she uses mm. that's not that common is to put a question within the poem and then answer it as she goes along. And even that last, those last two lines are such a contradiction that, you know, um, she, he, he's ridiculous. How can you hate birds? And then she looks up at the sky with him and God damn it, he's right. <laughs> those things are everywhere. Everything. And if we, if we were in a group together, wouldn't we be tempted, especially Carol, to say, you could cut that last line. <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm famous for that. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad and you it's a good up. thing as poets to always check the last line. It might be superfluous. In this case, it does something really surprising. Yeah, it's actually an interesting, I, I found Carol's, tech, Carol's uh, cut the last line to be such a good barometer for us because you have such a tendency to say, let me tell you one more time right. what I'm trying to say. Uh, Make yeah. sure you got it. Make sure yeah. the reader gets or to conclude. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I, th I think we learned that in grammar school. Some teacher must have taught us that. <laughs> well, you are a good student, Carol. Thank you for remembering it. <laughs> well, that's, it's good that we're talking about the ending a bit because it's essentially, you know, it's unresolved. Mm. You know, we, we don't know exactly what exactly she means by mm -hmm. losing. Did she mm -hmm. mean losing the argument? You know, mm -hmm. this battle that's been going on throughout the poem, is she just mm -hmm. kind of given up and blamed yeah. so, losing ground? Yeah, yeah, losing ground, losing, losing our parents. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and all that's such a complicated thing to unpack. So, so it's left on this kind of, you know, not conclusive, decidedly unconclusive ending and and we just have to deal with that as readers we don't know exactly what the answer key is here and we're okay with it because it was a beautiful ride or i am because and I, and actually thank you for saying that it brings me to my favorite thing we all have our certain things right as poets and especially if you teach poetry too so one of my favorite things in looking at a poem especially to give someone feedback or in my own poems to try to get them to their best possible real, realization is the level of mystery that people are comfortable with. Um, some readers want a poem that's totally 100% accessible and everything makes sense and lines up. But a lot of our poems that we write, they make sense to us because of the world we were living in in our heads and hearts. But on the page, we don't always spell it out for a reader who doesn't know us or isn't inside our mind. So how much mystery is the reader comfortable with? And then what reader are you going to write to or revise to, let's say? So in this case, the poem is quite accessible. The level of mystery is, it, it's not extremely mysterious, but she definitely leaves us with a few things to puzzle over and to keep the reader curious. Could I just say something? I think obviously the last line was not expected, but it shifts the power. Suddenly mm -hmm. the father has more power than the woman. I, I really okay. love the last line. Because he's right. Did you, right. Say, did it's you it's say you love the last line? Or, or I, do, I do. Because, you do, yeah. Yeah, it flips what's going on, you know, internally for her. All of a sudden, wow, he's right. <laughs> so... You know, maybe I should question all my assumptions mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. you know, my it, life. It, you life. cut it the way where Carol had, yes, it, it would lovely and lyrical, but this is, this, the, the, the um, you know, uh, the, the, what's going on in, uh, between the woman and mm -hmm. the father is suddenly shifted and gives him more ground, more, mm -hmm. more, more what? It also, it also brings out the speaker's humanity. Yes. She ultimately realizes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I also think in a group, we might think that ending with looking up at the sky together is too sweet an ending. Like that would be like, oh, maybe a little, a little too mushy, you know? A little right. sentimental, you know? Yeah. Word mm -hmm. sky, 
like yeah love and heart and those kind of <laughs> right, you know, right. they're like third rails for <laughs> right, know, right 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 so. I do love too that she gives us you know with all the hard stuff that she that you get out of this poem that she's also giving us a lot of humor um, yes yes you say yes I know how you're feeling and but it's funny too it's, it's mm -hmm. yeah yeah things and like another, eating, the, eating the mini eggs oh, I was just gonna say that Teresa <laughs> <laughs> and that's another losing thing like he finished all the eggs talk <laughs> about a symbolic image or a uh, concrete object eggs you know future life and growth and uh, abortion yeah. oh right exactly yeah mm -hmm. yep all right actually so we're we are running over i'm sure <laughs> he's just wondering when are, when are they gonna stop <laughs> but, um thank you all for being so patient we should give you a few minutes to see if you have any questions that you want to put in the chat for any one of us or just for the whole group, and, um, mm -hmm. you know, anything, if you want to talk about the poem itself, I think I'll stop my share. Oh, you know what? One last thing we wanted to do <laughs> is to read the poem one more time, just to see. Oh, right. Yeah. Yes. Is that okay, Keisha? Yeah, it's fine. Yes, because I think reading it a second time after talking about it, a lot of things are going to resonate that maybe didn't resonate the first time we read it. So, um, Helen, could you read for us again? Sure. Losing. After your father gets lost for the third time, you get angry because he won't answer his phone. Part of me wants him to stay lost. God, what has stolen my generosity? He pours a bowl of cereal and milk and leaves the refrigerator door open. He calls you boss and me mother. Yes, mother, he says, and rolls his eyes when I tell him to eat something to clean up after himself. Would I be more patient with a child? Would I love the smallness of a life more than the goneness of the mind? Yes. I don't know what to do with him, so I cook elaborately. Pea salad with blanched red onions, radishes and asparagus, scallop potatoes, all good things that come from the ground. He eats the mini eggs I've left for guests until they're gone. He says, how do you feel about abortion? I explain how you can eat violets and dandelions and wild chives so that we almost have an edible lawn. He says he hates birds. I laugh and ask him, how can you hate birds? He says he hates them because they're everywhere. They are all over, everywhere you look. And we look up at the sky together. Turns out he's right. Those damn things are everywhere. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. That's, That's what Eleanor point. does at the end of every poem. <laughs> <laughs> she sighs with satisfaction. <laughs> and if I don't, that might be a bad sign. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now, if anybody wants to ask a question, um, Keisha, I think, is going to... Oh, I'll stop sharing, I think. Here we go. Um, and Keisha, I think, is going to see if there are any questions there. And, you know, if you don't... Yeah, there, there are. there's a question, okay. but I just want to... Wonderful, um, absolutely wonderful. I think there is a therapeutic feel to the group and I'm so glad that the members of the group uh, maintain, you know, coming together despite uh, the pandemic. Um, I think you guys had zoomed down before a lot of other people did um, just for that. And all of what I've been able to witness today holds true to, I was reading an article about um, the, the lady mechanics of Verona. And in this article, I think it was from the local paper in Verona, it said that the mechanics adjust phrases, not vehicles. And that's exactly what you all have done <laughs> here. Love it. Poetry today, and it's just absolutely beautiful. So I, I hope that everybody has enjoyed. And um, we're gonna look to share some resources with you all. This session is being recorded. And as I mentioned before, 
you'll be able to go on to the library's YouTube page to view it and share it as you see fit. Um, but uh, one of the things, one of the questions that came up was about editing. And the question is, how do you find an editing group that will also review your manuscript? I don't know who would like to answer that question. That's different. That's difficult. It's it's yeah. very, I'll jump in and other people can too, but sure. one of the things I have to say is um, that it can take a very long time of working with people to get to know each other to this level. So I would say, you know, cultivating the writing relationships you have with other poets and then seeing if some of them are willing to do that with you but it, it's probably a pretty long process. To I, I, yeah, I was, I'll jump in. I agree, if, you're, if you were joining a writing group with the goal of getting a group of people who are gonna look at your manuscript, it's not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Or if it does, the feedback you get may not be that valuable. We didn't start out reading each other's manuscripts. We were working together for several years. Mm -hmm. We have, a high degree. I mean, everybody said commitment, commitment, commitment. If we miss mm -hmm. a week, that's a big deal. Yeah. It's, we're mm -hmm. not cavalier about it. Yeah. Um, and we're, we take each other's work very seriously. We also, not everybody's feedback is valuable for everybody. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I feel very lucky to be in a group where the feedback that I'm getting is feedback that helps me. It doesn't mean that other people's feedback isn't correct. It's just not helpful to me in my process. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be working with somebody for a long period of time to recognize the value of your feedback to them, their feedback to you, and to have that level of, of caring, really. It's like mm -hmm. really caring about people enough to be willing to mm -hmm. devote that kind of thoughtful energy. Mm -hmm. But I also think that it's something that we do for each other because we like each other's work and want it out in the world. So if someone doesn't have a manuscript that they're shopping around, we kind of are rooting for them. I mean, maybe I'm speaking for myself, but I, I want to have that deadline. And I've been in groups where, you know, some people will break off from a larger group and read each other's manuscript. Mm -hmm. That's, mm -hmm. that's important. Yeah. yeah, that does. It doesn't have to be the whole group. Yeah, yeah. So you can, you can, if your group isn't doing it, you can raise it and say, hey, let's make this be an accountability thing. If we do this as a group, we will get manuscripts out of it at the end. It's good for all of us. We'll get practice yeah. putting manuscripts together. And if everybody's not interested, then you can't force anyone, but you could say, right, Look, let's, right. let's break off. If there are three of us who are willing to do this, let's do it. Yeah, can I jump in again also, because, exactly, because I've noticed there are different types of writing groups and the two main things are, some groups are free flow, anybody can come and go, drop in if you want, disappear, come back a year later, and that's fine for a certain kind of uh, casual feedback or revision um, feedback. But this group evolved as a set number of people and we don't like the idea of you know excluding anyone, but what we have is working together so we're not inviting other people, not to be snobs, but just because we know what's a manageable number and it's working for us. So uh, Tina's suggestion is great. If you're in a larger group, maybe you know, try to pick a few people that you think you could work together as a smaller, co committed, cohesive group. Or you could start your own manuscript reading group if you want to put up a sign at a library. There are probably mm -hmm. other people out there. Marcia, go. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, you might want to ask the group that you're in, are they interested? And it's not as big as undertaking as it might seem. I think that's why we didn't do it at the beginning, because we're like, oh, manuscripts, that's a major thing. But if you send it out before, which is what we do, I think we do like at least two or three weeks, everybody reads it before and we come in ready to talk. And then it works and we can do it in the same amount of time, one manuscript that we do, you know, two poems for each person. So we're- It, it might help too to know that what we, what we generally do when we discuss a manuscript is first we give overall impressions of, of the full um, manuscript. And then we go through it, you know, poem by poem, sometimes in depth, sometimes 
quick comments on each poem on where it's placed, um, you know, what's, what's first, what's last, um, that kind of thing. But it, it, it's a structure of looking at the manuscript that, that I think would help even if you weren't looking at somebody else's, looking at your own as well. Mimi, did you have a question? Yeah, Mimi, Mimi has her hand up. I just wanted to say this was so delightful. <laughs> and I, I really enjoyed your interaction with each other. Really, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Thanks for coming. We actually well, like to together. Yeah. I just say yeah. she's my sister. I paid her. To yes. Say her. Yes. <laughs> oh, I loved what you said, Elle. I loved what I loved your poem and everything. <laughs> of course. <laughs> thank you. Anybody? Oh, Leah has her hand up. Leah, you want to ask a question? Yeah, I want to read her. And he just said, "This was wonderful." Um, it's, it's almost like being in a class someplace, mm -hmm. a course, you know, mm -hmm. where you're not just hearing other people's work or even editing, other, working on editing others' works, but you're just learning so much. And I really, really enjoy it. It's wonderful. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thanks for coming, Leah. Thanks everybody for coming. Really appreciate it. It's beautiful out there. It's April and mm -hmm. you guys are here with us on Zoom and we know everybody's hey, It's too. cloudy and looks like it's gonna rain any second in Califon right now. Oh. Oh. Which, by the way, it's not the background behind me. That's something. It's not looking so good in Maplewood either. Okay. <laughs> Maybe South Orange has all the sunshine. Don't oh, you? it's sunny in South Orange. <laughs> well, it's it's still lovely in South Jersey. Yay! <laughs> I just want to thank everybody for joining today, and I'm so very glad that you all found this to be wonderful, and you got something from it in in different ways. Teresa, thank you so much. Um, it's it's always a pleasure every time I see you and and speak with you, and and to all of the members, this is wonderful. Um, you are. Welcome to come back to the library. Uh, hopefully, you know, this time next year we'll, we'll be, you know, back to some level of normalcy. Um, but the, the while the library is open, the, the, the outdoor spaces are open. And so you're welcome to meet there if you'd like, you know, any particular evening, um, certainly as the weather warms up. And, um, you know, everybody's welcome to the library. You know, you... Let me just say that the library has some terrific events. What, two weeks ago, I, I watched a discussion on Zoom with Paul Auster, okay? Ooh. <laughs> Fantastic. So they, they yeah. have these events uh, here and there. And that, all of our content that we have is available on the library's YouTube page. So just head on over to YouTube and you just type in the South Orange Public Library. You can follow the library um, and then get the content there. You can also check us out on our website at sopl.org. We're on all forms of social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Give us a call. You can stop. In. We're open uh, five days a week and on Sundays. And we're also extending our weekend, excuse me, not weekend, our evening hours this week to be open until 8 p.m. Yeah. So just follow the guidelines and protocol. We just ask that you wear a mask whenever you come in and take your temperature. Otherwise, the library is there for you and so happy to be able to continue offering services to the community. 